Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. Hello and welcome to Monster Mondays. I'm Jeff Arbuckle, co-host of the podcast Film Seizure that you can catch each Wednesday at FilmSeizure.com or at a number of podcast providers online. It's been a bit, so let's hop into the TARDIS and go on an adventure with everyone's favorite Time Lord, Doctor Who. Uh, as 1976 was uh, dawning, Tom Baker was nearing the end of a successful second season in The Long Coat and Scarf as the fourth incarnation of the titular Doctor. It was overall the 13th season of Doctor Who, which began back in 1963's serial collectively titled An Unearthly Child. However, season 13 would be anything but unlucky for the series. The serial, uh, with serial after serial, uh, either being very well remembered or rank very high on several Doctor Who aficionados lists. Um, there's a horror element to Terror of the Zygons. Uh, Terror of the Zygons introduces us to a shape-shifting alien race that also uh, has a whole subplot with the Loch Ness Monster too. The Android Invasion. That was an episode where uh, androids replaced characters, including the Doctor and Sarah Jane. Pyramids of Mars is one of the more iconic episodes in Tom Baker's early years. In fact, I seem to remember a time when you could rather easily obtain Pyramids of Mars on VHS, either due to, I don't know, like a subscription service or something, uh, but it was out there for sure. Now, season 13 also saw the release of this week's Monster Monday's featured topic, The Brain of Morbius. Uh, this interesting little four-part serial was the next-to-last serial of the 13th season. Uh, this tale would introduce another Time Lord in the form of Morbius, whose brain needs a new body. It also introduces the Sisterhood of Karn. They, too, have a connection to the Time Lords. Um, I find the story to be more interesting because it's a Frankenstein tale, and we'll get more into that uh in a very short moment but for me though this is one of those doctor who stories that is burrowed deeply into my memory i feel like this is a, one of the first episodes maybe i ever watched um i mean maybe it was something else but it was this era of episodes that i remember seeing first um yeah, I would have likely been really young, like six or seven, when I first had any idea of what Doctor Who was. I've mentioned this before, but it was due to my oldest brother being a fan that gave me my uh, in with the series. Here in Indiana, it played on WFYI Channel 20, our PBS station, for, God, probably for like 20 years. Um, maybe the serial uh, is not truly as intertwined with memories of being a teeny tiny uh, little guy, but... Um, it, it just might just be a good representation of what I think of Dr. Who in that mid seventies era, but we'll talk more about that as we get into the three things I like about this particular serial. Now our story takes place. Uh, on a sort of uh, desolate and inhospitable planet called Karn. An insectoid-like creature seems to uh, just be doing his thing. Uh, we find out later that he is kind of soft-landed in an escape pod onto Karn. Um, but he is uh, attacked and killed by a half-witted assistant named Kondo. He decapitates the creature and returns to the lab run by his master, Solon. Uh, due to the creature not being warm-bodied, uh, the head is useless to Solon. Soon, the TARDIS materializes and the Doctor storms out to shout angrily at the Time Lords, who he uh, believes manipulated the TARDIS to land on this planet against his original coordinates that he set. Now, he tells the ever-faithful Sarah Jane Smith that the Time Lords must want him to do some dirty business for them. The Doctor defiantly refuses to do anything but play with his yo-yo, while Sarah Jane, uh, on the other hand, takes a look around the planet. She notices that there are likely a dozen wrecked spaceships in this one part of a valley. And uh, she soon finds the body of the insectoid creature, which the doctor refers to as a mutt, which is a, thro a throwback to a third doctor story called the mutants. Um, now, the doctor realizes the planet stars are very familiar to him. They are in the cosmic neighborhood of his home planet of Gallifrey. Elsewhere, a group of women led by the elderly Marin discover that the Doctor and Sarah Jane are wandering about. Marin leads the sisterhood of Karn. 
Um, they are the protectors of the fabled elixir of life. Considering the only way someone could get to Karn undetected is uh, through the use of a TARDIS, Marin believes the Doctor is here to steal the elixir as the Sisterhood of Karn uses that potion at times to assist the Time Lords with problematic regenerations. Uh, Marin thinks the Time Lords have been planning to steal the last of the waning drops of the elixir for themselves for centuries. And the Sisterhood uses their powers to teleport the TARDIS to their lair while the Doctor and Sarah Jane seek shelter from a rainstorm. That shelter they find happens to be the home of Solon. Now, Solon is quite pleased with two warm, bo- warm blooded humanoids um, who have uh, recently stumbled into his life. He really likes the Doctor's cranium. And the doctor sees a clay molding of a head that Solon has made. And he recognizes the face, but before he can blurt out who he thinks it is, uh, Solon covers the sculpture and shoes the doctor away from it. However, the doctor knows exactly who Solon is. He's one of the universe's foremost neurosurgeons, but his disappearance led to many worried that Solon fell in with the cult of Morbius. The mere mention of Morbius makes Solon a little nervous. And the doctor also knows that this is Karn and that the sisterhood lives here. Solon gives the doctor and Sarah Jane wine that is meant to uh, basically knock them out. However, only the doctor drinks the wine. Sarah Jane didn't like it. So only fake drinking it. uh, And uh, so she has to fake passing out when the doctor goes down. When Con, uh, when uh, Kondo and Solon take off with the doctor to prepare him for some pretty nasty head surgery, Sarah Jane wakes up and seeks out a way to save the doctor. Luckily, the Sisterhood of Karn is able to use their powers to teleport their perceived enemy to their lair. So the doctor is saved from Solon's butchery. Not aware of this, though, Sarah Jane continues looking around for uh, around Solon's castle, where she finds the carcass of a headless mutt with a human hand and wire sticking out of its neck. Oh, and also, it is able to still move around without a head, too. Now, when the doctor awakens in the lair of the Sisterhood of Karn, uh, he learns from Marin that the Time Lords destroyed Morbius there on Karn, and they spread his physical body to several different places. But the doctor says that he could feel Morbius' spirit, or more accurately, his mind present with him when he was at Solon's castle. Despite the doctor claiming that he has nothing to do with Marin's charges about the Time Lords wanting to steal the Elixir of Life, they plan to sacrifice him anyway, and Solon tries saving the doctor by requesting the Sisterhood leave his head or sacrifice his buddy Kondo instead. Uh, Marin tells him to basically get lost and goes back to killing, uh, trying to kill the doctor. But the good news is, is that Sarah Jane snuck into the Sisterhood's lair and saves the doctor. But Sarah Jane is blinded when Marin tries to use her mystical ring to shoot at the escapees. Now, the doctor returns to Solon's and requests that he examines Sarah Jane's eyes. Uh, Solon claims that the retinas are totally burned out, so there is no hope of her ever seeing again. Except for one thing. The only hope is for her uh, to be given the elixir of life. So the doctor needs to, uh, basically go get the regenerative potion from the sisterhood. Now, Solon is lying and sends Kondo to go to the sisterhood ahead of the doctor to tip them off that their supposed enemy is returning. The idea again is to bargain for the doctor's head. Uh, meanwhile, Sarah Jane hears a disembodied voice calling for Solon and discovers a brain in a jar who she soon learns is the brain of Morbius. Um, When the doctor arrives to request the sisterhood give him some of the elixir for Sarah Jane, it's revealed that the blindness will actually fade and she'll be fine on her own in time. Uh, This gives the doctor and Marin a chance to talk and sort out their differences, particularly as it pertains to uh, Solon and what he is doing on this planet. Um, and it's the sisterhood that wrecks all of those spaceships because they're terrified of someone stealing their elixir. However, they didn't realize that Solon right there under their noses is trying to revive the worst time Lord of them all Morbius. So the doctor bargains with the sisterhood. He'll get rid of Solon, or at least Morbius, and they have to stop wrecking spaceships. He can also figure out why their sacred flame 
that is used in the making of the elixir is dying out. He says that the flame is from the planet's core, so if it's dying out, there must be some scientific reason. And he figures out what the issue is, and the flame revives, roaring larger than it has for years. Now that the Sisterhood of Karn is on the Doctor's side, and now that Morbius has learned from Solon that the Doctor, who was intended to be the body for Morbius, is a Time Lord, the renegade Time Lord demands that he be placed into whatever body that Solon was working on uh, that was available to them. Despite Solon saying uh, that, uh, you know, that what he will only you know that this will only basically cause morbius unimaginable pain as the body is not really suitable for him morbius says he doesn't have time to wait any longer the doctor's supposedly accidental arrival on karn can only mean the time lords know he's there and sent him to deal with this uh when kondo discovers solon's placed his arm on the patchwork patchwork monster for morbius because kondo has a uh, hook for a hand um Kondo realizes that uh, Solomon was never going to make with his make good on his promises to give his servant his arm back. Um, so he gets mad, knocks Morbius's brain jar over, causing the brain to hit the floor. Solon then shoots Kondo in the hopes of killing him and forces the blind Sarah Jane to assist him with the operation to revive Morbius in the monster body. And the operation is a success. Sarah Jane regains her eyesight just in time to see the monstrous Morbius. And because he's too quick to have gotten up after the operation and there are still some things that need to be done more properly, uh, the creature is terribly unstable and his brain is also a little damaged and he's none too pleased about his appearance. Um, he also doesn't like fire that much. But uh, with Monster Morbius on the loose, Solon assembles a tranquilizer gun to knock the creature out to finish the operation to make Morbius more himself. The Doctor and Solon find the monster after he's killed one of the members of the Sisterhood and subdue him. The Doctor wants Solon to disassemble the Morbius creature, but when the Doctor leaves uh, the room that, that Morbius and Solon are in to check on Sarah Jane, who is sleeping off a nasty bump on the head, Solon leaves Morbius alive and locks the Doctor and Sarah Jane in another room while he fixes the creation to give Morbius his proper senses. Morbius awakens and, his, and has become his former self again. The Doctor challenges Morbius to a mind-bending contest that does eventually cause Morbius to uh, practically short himself out because his current form is not really strong enough to withstand the mental pressure. He's eventually hunted down by the Sisterhood of Karn, and with the Doctor in a coma from his uh, strain of that contest, uh, he's given help from the Elixir of Life by the Sisterhood, and he revives immediately. Marin would eventually sacrifice herself to save the Doctor, and the Doctor and Sarah Jane head off into more adventures. But let's talk about the three things I like about this Doctor Who adventure, The Brain of Morbius. First, this episode features some of the quintessential concepts that Doctor Who was probably best known for in the 70s, and especially the mid-70s. Throughout the course of the 70s, only two actors played the character, John Pertwee, my personal favorite, and the literal face of the franchise, Tom Baker. So with Baker... And his bohemian ways of playing the Time Lord, the floppy-haired man in the scarf, who is simultaneously something of a tramp, but also absolutely the smartest man in the room and just waiting for you to give him what he needs to put all the pieces together around your true scheme. Now, no matter the fact that Tom Baker's doctor would have a trio of very strong companions throughout his run, uh, particularly in his first six seasons, the one he is best known for traveling the universe with is Sarah Jane Smith. Elizabeth Sladen's much adored fan favorite is here too. And then you also have the BBC look of the episode with the color videotape that is both super unique to Doctor Who, but also looks like almost every soap opera from the 60s and 70s um, in the way that it looks. Um, there's a very weird uh, almost definition to that era of videotape and and how that made the doctor who series look is just very unique we also have the limited sets with the rocky bits uh where the mutt and the tardis was early on you have the home of solon 
and the lair of the sisterhood of Karn. Um, that's all very classic Doctor Who to have very limited number of places to go, particularly in a late season episode. Um, additionally, Oh, and, and also it should be said that you don't see the inside of the TARDIS at all in this episode either. And if I had to guess, everything was either done on the same soundstage redressed for whatever purpose it, it was needed, um, or it was very limited in the number of uh, sets that they, or stages that they had, uh, you know, uh, that they had access to. But um it's all very classic Doctor Who. And then, then you have the uh, sisterhood of Karn, uh, women in this case, who are, you know, um, the way that they look is very of this time, too. They're wearing flowing outfits, and they have strange makeup on their face to give themselves more of a golden complexion and with uh, some additional, like, red makeup around their eyes and various different f- patterns. Um You know, that's very common for a lot of Doctor Who alien characters in this Tom Baker era in the 70s. You know, they're they're mostly just human, but maybe they have, you know, gold or silver complexion or some sort of uh, extra bushy eyebrows or just some uh, flair of makeup around like their eyes or their mouth or their nose or whatever. Um, And it has that opening that features the famous time tunnel kind of title sequence. I mean, this is one of the handful of episodes that has all the feel and attitude and look of the Tom Baker era that uh, quite honestly made Doctor Who and Baker's portrayal of the character so iconic 50 years after he took on the role. And it's just it, it features all of those things that I think of instantly when I just hear the words Doctor Who. John Pertwee might be my favorite doctor, but it's this era with Tom Baker that is the first thing I think of. Um, Second, this is kind of a small thing, but kind of important in the grander scheme of things. This is one of the rare episodes of the classic era that actually references the doctor's former appearances in a visual way. The doctor does directly say in reference that he used to have a more silver appearance with his hair. And Sarah Jane even says that she liked that look on him. And yes, this was after the episode, the three doctors, which was a 10th anniversary episode that featured John Pertwee, Patrick Troughton and William Hartnell, all uh, interacting with one another. And later there will be the five doctors and another episode uh, in which the Daleks discover the identity of the doctor as being a past foe of theirs by looking back into the previous incarnations prior to that fifth doctor. when that happened, the sixth doctor had a couple of instances in which past doctors were referenced as well as the seventh doctor. But my point is for continuity's sake, it was rare for direct references to be made about past incarnations or past actual events that you can see in episodes. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that reruns weren't really a thing back then. If you missed an episode, you missed it. So referencing it doesn't really, isn't really good. Um, you just have to keep moving forward with the series. Now, um, But what's more with this episode, we are actually shown images of quote unquote past versions of the doctor. And there are more shown than just three past versions. This was the eventual reference made in the much maligned timeless child storyline in the 13th doctor's era. Um, It could be argued that uh, the eight other faces shown in the brain duel thing that the doctor and Morbius engaged in were actually former selves of Morbius as he too was a time Lord. But at the time, I do think it was intended that these were past versions of the doctor beyond William Hartnell. So William Hartnell might've been the first doctor on screen, but not the actual first doctor. And that was heavily used as inspiration for that 13th doctor storyline. Regardless, I do like that there is additional lore weaving through this episode. Morbius is another renegade time Lord. The time Lords likely did hijack the TARDIS and brought the doctor here to stop Solon. Um, there's the sisterhood of Karn that would also come back into the fold later in modern who, And then the extra reference to the third doctor's looks, as well as the doctor's past incarnations in general. The Brain of Morbius isn't a typical Doctor Who episode, but it finds a way to really add on to the whole lore of the series itself. 
And speaking of it not being a typical Doctor Who episode, I mean, the third, like, come on, right? I mean, this is a wonderful adaptation of a Frankenstein-like story specifically made for Doctor Who. It's not totally one-to-one in terms of comparison between the two ideas, but let's talk about this. You have uh, Kondo, who is a dim-witted servant of a brilliant neurosurgeon, and Kondo doesn't just have a hook for a hand, but he also has a hunchback. Um, That brilliant neurosurgeon is trying to do some morally corrupt things with bodies and dead tissue. The neurosurgeon does revive someone who was dead, and that someone is inside the body of a monster that isn't exactly controllable at first. Oh, and that neurosurgeon lives in a castle and his monster gets enraged after being scared by fire. Sometimes the best Doctor Who stories are the ones that are almost purposely trying to avoid the time travel or science fiction heavy elements. Sometimes they have historical elements. Sometimes they have horror elements. Sometimes they have vague allusions to social or political issues. This is one of those stories that I often find myself thinking about almost unprompted. The way the Morbius monster looks, the sisterhood of Karn, the dreary, stormy atmosphere of the planet of Karn. Um, There are better Doctor Who episodes. There are better stories from Tom Baker's era alone. Hell, there are better Doctor Who episodes in the 13th season, which is where the brain of Morbius appears in. All of those things are true, but this is an episode that is so burned into my memory that I get a real nice, warm, and fuzzy feeling whenever I watch it, and it's because of how quintessential it is, or how it does play with the with the continuity of Doctor Who, and the fact that it is a Frankenstein tale. But that wraps up this week's Monster Mondays. You can catch new episodes of Monster Mondays each Monday afternoon at FilmSeizure.com. Don't forget to follow Film Seizure at Facebook, Threads, Instagram, and Blue Sky. You can also subscribe to Film Seizure to get both the Film Seizure podcast and Monster Mondays at your favorite podcast providers. We also upload those episodes to YouTube. You can also check out my website, bmovieenema.com, to read new articles and reviews every Friday morning. Next time, let's check in with another old friend of Monster Mondays. Yes, it's going to be a big old monster battle royale with 1968's Destroy All Monsters. Until next week, stay spooky.